It's no secret that real estate is one of the best investment vehicles out there. But with all the current uncertainty, how do we know when and where to put our hard-earned money to work for us? It's easy to become distracted by that shiny object or the quote-unquote next best thing. So how do we determine which strategies will best align with our financial goals? Whether you're an active real estate entrepreneur, a passive investor, or looking to get into real estate investing, our goal is to provide investors with the insights and strategies to build our portfolios all while protecting our capital. I'm Danny Nichols. And I'm Chris Thompson. This is the Two Smart Assets Real Estate Investing Podcast. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the show. This is the Two Smart Assets Real Estate Investing Podcast. I am your host, Danny Nichols, here once again with my co-host, Chris Thompson. Hey, what's going on, Danny, man? It's a good day to be here. Man, it's always a good day when we're talking to each other. We're talking about real estate, man, bringing on great guests. Um, you know, before we jump into that, though, I want to make sure our guests really know that we truly appreciate them tuning in. You know, if you guys have uh, any interest in showing some love to the show, we really appreciate you uh, subscribing and leave us, leaving us a rating and written review. Really helps us attract more guests, grow the podcast, and ultimately provide better information for everyone listening. So if you take some time to do that for us, we truly appreciate it. Um, now that we got that out of the way, I got to tell you, Chris, man, super excited about today's guest. Been waiting to connect with this guy for a long time. So uh, very excited to bring this to our listeners. Tell everybody who we spoke with today. Okay, so today we brought in Gino Barbaro, uh, of the Jake and Gino Group. Gino is an investor. He's a business owner author and is an entrepreneur. And as a real estate entrepreneur, he's grown his portfolio to over a hundred million dollars in assets under management and is teaching others how to do the exact same thing. Gino is the co-founder of the Jake and Gino a multifamily real estate education company that offers coaching and training in real estate, which is founded upon their proprietary framework of buy right, manage right, and finance right. Uh, and today we spoke about his journey uh, to reaching financial freedom and beginning to invest in multifamily and financial education for the young. You know, Gino's the man. He's a great guy. Loved it. Man, great episode. I learned a ton on this one, you know, and Gino just spitting fire, you know, a lot of great stuff on this one. And the thing is, you know, he didn't hit, in the Jake and Gino group, they're putting out some, you know, amazing content. They're they're really teaching uh, investors to to drive these investments home, being great apartment syndicators, and that's important for us passive investors, right? We want to be able to connect with these people who are doing things, uh, making moves, and uh, investing in good things. With that being said, you know we're passive investors, and if you're a passive investor or looking to get into passive investing, then make sure to check out our website at twosmartassets.com. There you can find our passive investing guide and a part of syndication sample deal that will have you primed and ready for the real opportunities coming your way. So jump on there, twosmartassets.com. Go check it out. If you have any questions or comments, just hit us up. Uh, we'd love to talk with you guys. All right, now that we got that out of the way, let's jump in today's episode with Gino Barbaro. What's going on, everybody? Today's guest is Gino Barbaro. Gino is an investor, business owner, author, and entrepreneur. As a real estate entrepreneur, he has grown his portfolio to over $100 million in assets under management and is teaching others how to do the same. Gino is co-founder of the Jake and Gino Group, a multifamily real estate education company that offers coaching and training in real estate, which was founded upon the proprietary framework of buy right, manage right, and finance right. Gino, it's great to see you, man. Welcome to the show. Guys, I love the name of the show, Two Smart Assets. Do you know why? I have a six-year-old and she runs around the house sometimes and she'll say, you're an asset. And she'll be pointing at her butt and saying that because she can't curse, right? And the kids hate that. But I'm like, that's a compliment because an asset is what we want. We don't want a liability. We want an asset. So kudos to the name of the show. I love it, Bryce. No, Nice little fun play on words, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Appreciate that. You know, Gino, uh, we've been big fans of, of the Jake and Gino group for quite a while now. Actually, we've had a few of your members on our show. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I got to tell you, uh, you, just a great group of people you guys got to go over there. Whatever you guys are doing over there is uh, is pretty fantastic. And we just want to give you mad props for that because we think you're doing some great stuff um, and making some serious moves. And, you know, you know you're know, you putting all this together. You've, you've come from a, a, a part of your life where, you know, you weren't in real estate investing. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about at first. Talk mm -hmm. to us about those early days before financial freedom, before real estate investing, and then how you made this transition into financial freedom and, you know, really started to snowball this into the momentum that you have now. Well, the premise is you don't attract what you want. You attract what you are. And that might be tough for people to swallow. But when I was in the restaurant business, I had one restaurant. I was doing okay. Didn't know how to scale. It was all the employees fault. And I attracted what I was. I wasn't a great employer. 
I didn't have the business skills and I was out there blaming everybody else. And as you guys had said, the hundred year real estate just launched and I've, you know, coupled with another mentor, we started a business, never would have had that opportunity 10 years ago because I wasn't ready for that opportunity. And a lot of hard work goes into it. And I think the biggest thing that anybody can take from this podcast or from listening is we need to have that long-term mindset. You know, what is a hundred year real estate investor? What is that all about? There's a lot of characteristics, but the first one that really changed my life is you need to be a hundred percent real estate junkie or responsibility junkie. You need to be responsible for your life. And if you are at a certain point in your life that you don't like, fess up to it. It's okay. I was at a point in my life back in 2008, didn't like where I was. I was doing okay, but I knew I was wasting what God gave me. He gave me two great parents, born in, I think, the best country on the planet, had opportunity, people making millions of dollars during the Great Recession. I wasn't one of them. I was blaming everybody else. Once I understood that it's not anybody else's fault but my own, I sucked it up and I started going personal development hardcore. I remember sitting there reading T. Harvecker's book, Secrets of the Millionaire Mind, Back in 2008, I'm like, this guy is a dick. What? A, I mean, like, <laughs> I'm reading it and I'm thinking, but then I stopped. And I said, you know, he's right. I mean, your fruits come from your roots. And that's when I said, I need personal development. I need to, to get coached. I need to get mentored. I need to go to life coaching. I needed that all because of what he said. And fast forward 10 years later, I'm, I'm interviewing the guy who ultimately changed my life. So it doesn't have to take forever. All you need is a couple of changes. And I think one of the things that really helped me out was the accountability piece, the, having a great partner like Jake, knowing what I wanted. I, I didn't lack motivation. I was a really motivated dude. I, I lacked clarity. I didn't know what I wanted. So everybody out here who's listening, you know, what do you want from life? We don't stop and think of that sometimes, right? I, I didn't want to be at the restaurant anymore, but that's not what I wanted. I just didn't want to be there. What did I actually want to do? I wanted to build a great business. I wanted to be surrounded by amazing people. I wanted to impact other people's lives. And how did, how could I do that? I couldn't do that by washing dishes in the back of the kitchen. It just wasn't happening. That's what was making me miserable. What I ultimately found out was going to life coaching school, figuring out what my goals were, figuring out what my big why was. I saw that multifamily real estate could allow me to do that. I could build a great business. And then from there, start some type of coaching slash education that I didn't have to monetize early on because I had the real estate that could, that could keep me afloat. And if I make money with the education, great. If not, I'm still podcasting, uh, as you said, Michael Gerber, Steve Robinson from you know Chick-fil-A, Robert Kiyosaki, these people that I would never have spoken to unless I had a Jake and Gino platform. So sometimes it's not about the money. It's ultimately comes down to once you become financially free, you're chasing the opportunity. And that's all financial freedom really does to you. It alleviates that stress of not having to pay the bills every month and saying, I can let this opportunity go because I don't need to make money on that. I'd rather do something else and focus on the long term because I'm not going to make money in the short term, especially with multifamily. You guys know, sometimes it takes 12 to 18 months before a deal makes sense and starts cash flowing, but that's okay because you can do that. You have that long term mindset. Yeah, absolutely. And you you know, you make a lot of great points. And I want to um, ask one question of, you You know, there's a lot of people that we talk to, they say, you know, we want financial freedom, you know, based on, you know, whatever metrics they have. But a lot of people that we also, you know, speak with, they have a lot of trouble uh, getting there, you know, even taking those, those steps to even, you know, I don't even know what to do all of a sudden, mm -hmm. just to just to get that financial freedom. It seems very difficult to for them to get that. What do you think the big issue is with those people who have that that block there? Oh, I mean, I think most of us live in our subconscious, we're not even conscious of what we want. And for me, I, I mean, I went to coaching school, it's really limiting beliefs, it's your energy blocks, and, and, and just basic fundamental financial intelligence. I'm not a big Dave Ramsey fan because I think what he teaches, there's a lot of great and a lot of stuff where debt, debt is the new asset nowadays. If you guys know how to utilize debt, it's amazing. But if you're not even financially intelligent, start with Dave Ramsey. Start with an emergency fund. So if you, so your car breaks down, you can pay for it. Put three to six months of money aside. So if you decide to leave your job, you can do that. Take control of your income and your expenses. Create a budget. If you start a budget today, you'll probably save about 17 to 20% of your income. This is all basic stuff. But that's not where it ends. Dave Ramsey ends there. We talk about whole life. Whole life is terrible. He says, no, whole life is fantastic if it's a vehicle and you know how to utilize it because the wealthiest corporations in this war in the country, it's the tier one asset, Bank of America, all these companies own it and all the wealthy own it. But I think we get caught up in that, oh, I just have to stay here. You have to grow. We all have different inflection points in our lives and we need to continue to grow. If you told me I'd be making X amount of money a month now, five years ago, I thought you're crazy. 
but you start growing and then you start learning these skills and all of a sudden more opportunities come to you. So go back to the basics. It's income over expenses. And in the budget, not don't look at it as income as stable. What else do you need to do to grow your income? Because you can grow your income. You can get on more sales calls. You can get another job. You can invest in assets. Your expenses is where people struggle. You don't have to live below your means. Just direct your money to where you want to spend it. Right. I give you a quick example. When I moved to Florida here, you know, this family of eight, we have six kids. I wanted to know what my food budget was. I'm spending between three and four grand a month just on that, just on groceries. Didn't know that until I sat down and did a budget. I was spending even more. But then once I saw, I said, you know what? Let me direct it. I'm going to go to Costco. I'm going to go to Walmart, buy my groceries there. And it's not, it's just a mindset, really. And it's all about trying to divert it and trying to take control. It's really about, you know, that instant gratification where let me delay it. Let me not buy those stupid things that I don't need, especially early on. Because then when you do have the money, you don't even want those things anymore. That's not what financially free to me is anymore. Financially free is I'm doing a podcast Friday in the afternoon. I want to be here with you guys. And that's what it's all about. It's not about retiring. It's about really doing what you ultimately want to do about your soul passion. Yeah. And that's, and that's huge, right? We all want that, that freedom to basically do what we want to do. Right. And that's kind of, mm-hmm. that's kind of the big thing. And I know all three of us here today believe in the power of real estate investing. I mean, that's kind of why we're, we're here today talking about this stuff, but I want to talk about why you believe, uh, or you consider real estate investing to be one of the best ways to achieve financial freedom. That's what we've chosen. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what you've chosen. What, why do you think it's so powerful in that regard? Well, I mean, it is the single biggest, I think, driver of the economy. I mean, they take away the 1031, goodbye real estate, right? I mean, everyone is tied to it. You have title companies, you have accountants, you have real estate brokers, mortgage brokers. It's really the driver. For apartments, it's a basic human need. It's food, clothing, and apartments. You need a place to live, right? And there's so many niches. You can do single family. You can do multifamily. You can do self-storage. You can do office, retail, light industrial. There's so many different aspects of real estate. Pick one. Become a master of it. Learn it really well. Don't have the shiny object syndrome. Back to the long-term mindset. If all of a sudden you get into multifamily and everyone says there's no deals out there, there's going to be deals sooner or later. There's something we call a market cycle. Now, when the deals start coming, then people are going to say, well, there's no money out there. That's how life is. When I started back in 2010, 2011, syndication really wasn't around. There were deals. The economy sucked. It was 1% GDP growth. Rents were in the toilet, right? But there was no money. There was no syndication. So asset prices were lower. Now, as things started to inflate, it was easier to come by money. There were less deals. So for me, I think real estate has got so many benefits, the tax benefits that we get through cost segregation. I think if you want to be a passive investor, you can if you start investing in syndications. That's another avenue to do it. I think the scalability is amazing. You can buy, we bought a 25-unit property in our first deal. Instead of, you know, Chris going out there and showing me 25 single-family homes, I bought them all at one shot, right? A lot easier to do that. You have economies of scale. We were still working full-time in our jobs. We were able to do it part-time. And when we got a certain number of units, Units under management, we were able to hire property managers, maintenance techs, and it's really an ability to scale. As Michael Gerber had said, you have your little business where you start out, and then ultimately you become an enterprise. That's what you want with real estate. And I think everyone has to have the mind shift of it's not just tenants and toilets and trash. That's really important, landlording. But you want to what you want to ultimately become is a multifamily entrepreneur. You want to look at it as an entrepreneurial venture where you're building a business, where you're the leader here, you're the visionary, your your goals are to start implementing systems, buying these properties and having people work with you and continue to scale and grow that business. You guys have created a lot of success, you know, in your group with, you know, we mentioned before we've spoken with a lot of people in your group and they are knocking out of the park, right? And so with that being said, um, you know, you have a structure for your for your program, which we talked about before. It's the uh, uh, the three step framework, you know, the buy right, manage right, finance right, mm-hmm. can, you know, can, can you talk a little bit about that structure? You know, what would it consist of like a little bit more granular and why it's proven yeah. to be so successful for you and the, you know, the vet, the investors in your group? For, so for us, when we started out, Jake and I just started buying deals. We had no framework. We had no education. I had no community. And there was one recurring theme that we saw throughout every deal. First of all, we bought for mom and pops. We bought distressed properties. But the second thing was there were three elements to every deal, which was the buy right portion, the manage right portion, and the finance right portion. And Jake's sitting on his lawn one day, cutting the grass, and he's got a wheelbarrow there. And he looks at it. And he's like, hmm, three legs. The buy right portion is the back leg. 
once it's done, it's fixed. So you have to set up your buy right criteria when you're analyzing multifamily. Once again, what are you looking for when you're buying a deal? Are you looking for lower or higher cap rates? Are you looking for cash on cash return? Are you looking for newer assets? You need to set up your buy right criteria. And you know it also will fluctuate with the market cycle. I'll talk about the three pillars in one second, but really become focused and crystal clear on that. So when you find a deal, you know to go after that deal. The other leg is the finance right. What kind of finance right are you going to get on the deal? Can you use creative financing? Are you going to use community banks? Are you going to use bridge? Are you going to use the agency? And that comes with what is the exit strategy of property? You need to know what you're going to do with the property with the exit. Once you have both of those legs done, the manage right is that wheel, which is in constant motion. So are you going to get third-party property management? Or are you going to, are you going to do it yourself? Are you going to self-manage? Those three components, once you break it down, you really need to focus at it from that lens. If one of those is off, if you bought the property, but your financing stinks, it's wobbly. If you bought it right and you're financed it right, but your management sucks, guess what? It's difficult. And over the years, one of our coaches came up with the three pillars of real estate. We've trademarked it because I thought it was genius. He didn't make it up. He just pulled it all together. When you look at the three pillars of real estate, it's the market cycle, it's the debt, and the exit strategy. Every time you look at a property, what are you going to do with that deal? What is the exit of the deal? You should always be thinking about it. Is it a buy and hold forever? Is it a refi? Is it a flip? That's really, really important. Assess where you are in the market cycle. Is the market cycle you know, at a hyper supply? Are you at a recession? The market cycle is going to tell you what type of assets you're buying. And the debt is going to be you know, dictated by what that exit strategy is. So when you're looking at it from a holistic picture, you want to take a look at the three pillars of real estate, analyze the deal through that, but utilize the three-step framework, the buy right, manage right, and finance right out of that. Does that make sense, guys? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that, that that makes a lot of sense. And you know, I think the thing is too is a lot of real estate investors don't take all of that into consideration. You know, we didn't, the, Daniel. We right. did in the beginning, and that's the mistakes that we made. So, how do you limit your downside risk in investing? You need to get educated, and then you need to take action. If you don't do both of those, that's the problem. And when we started buying deals. We weren't really looking at cap rates. We were looking at one metric. We were looking at cash on cash return. Now that I've learned it, we actually did a video today. You look at NOI, you're looking at cap rates, you're looking at a debt service coverage ratio, right? You're looking at the, the property buildings in A, B, or C. You're looking at all of these different metrics, cash on cash, to figure out what your parameters are. This part of the cycle, I'll tell you right now, we're looking at assets that are a little bit newer because right now we're, we're calling this the CapEx tsunami. If you're buying a C property in some of these markets where there are three and four caps, you're overpaying for them. And then all of a sudden you need to replace everything, cast iron plumbing, roofs, driveways, you better budget for that because that's going to be the problem. That's where we are in the market right now. So we're like, you know what? Let's look for assets that are a little bit newer. We may have to pay a little bit more on the front end, but it's okay because we don't want all of that. Now, when the market resets and these prices tend to go down with the C properties, then let's look at them. It really comes back to a function of pricing. And I don't mind looking at older older assets if I can buy them for the right price. But you know, sellers right now, they're unrealistic in some of their expectations. I don't blame them. If they can get the price, fine. But it's the race to 80. You need to look at 80 deals before you find that that one great deal. And some people aren't willing to put in that work. I mean, 80 deals is a lot. You're analyzing five deals a week. It's going to take you, you know, 15, 18 weeks before you find that one deal on the phone with the brokers doing the property tour. So always taking the consideration of those three pills of real estate and the and the uh, three-step framework. I think it's great that you guys have defined these things and at these actually put these down on paper and you know created a system for them. Because I think a lot of, especially like you said, new investors, they're not doing these things, but you guys, you're teaching these things in your group, right? And so mm-hmm. you're really setting your 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 mentees up for success when they're out there actually doing these deals. So I think mm-hmm. it's a huge benefit, man. And I, I love that you guys are doing that for sure. Um, I do want to take kind of a, a quick transition real quick. Um, you know, as a coach and a mentor, you've seen, uh, you know, you go through, have a lot of people in your group. You've seen, uh, you know, all sorts of different investors come in there, be a part of that, uh, you know, from rookie investors, maybe something a little bit more uh, um, intermediate and then also, you know, moving up higher. Um, and I'm curious, you know, we see some some investors, they start off and they, they have this rapid succession, uh, you know, just accelerate their progress so fast to success, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm curious with all the, all, the, all the coaching and mentoring you've done, what's the number one thing or maybe like a common trait you see in the people who are the most successful at being active in apartment investing? That's a great question. I mean, it's hard to answer, but this is going to sound like, I don't know, you may not believe me. 
I really think it comes down to mindset. And for me, it came down to mindset and and you're going to get kicked in the stomach a lot in this business. And you're going to get kicked in the stomach a lot in any business you do. The ones that really succeed are the ones that stick through it, having that big enough why. I had a big enough why. I hated the restaurant. I hated washing dishes. I hated working on Christmas Eve. I hated working on the weekends. I hated working and not making a lot of money. I had a big why, right? That was my why. And I wasn't going to quit. I just... That was just it. And I see a lot of the students that come on, they have that burning desire to succeed. You need that because, you know, the business gets hard. You can go six months without finding a deal. We only did two deals last year. That's tough sometimes. So for me, it really comes down to mindset, figuring out what are my goals and how do I stick with it? And I think the other thing, Daniel, is you need to be a team player in multifamily. You need to be able to get out of your comfort zone. I'm an introvert. You know, I don't want to hear anybody out there that I don't like to network. I don't like it either. I mean, we're having an MM4. There's going to be 600 people. Do you think I feel comfortable speaking as fun as 600 people? I don't, but I've got people relying on me. I've got to get better at it and I've got to get out of my comfort zone. And the more people you meet in this business, the more opportunity you're going to have. I'd rather stay home on a Friday night and hang out by myself. I'm not going to lie to you, but sometimes you got to do what, what you don't feel like doing. And the community was built to have that network, to have the ability to go meet other people, to be able to partner. Because you may be a great capital raiser, but you're a terrible operator. Well, here is an operator. Here is a capital raiser. Put them together and they're a match made in heaven. In the beginning, you may have to do everything yourself, but to scale up, you're going to find partners. And when you look at you look at groups and you look at people who have done really well, there aren't that many people out there that scale up by themselves. You know, you have a Jake and Gino. You, there's a lot of people out there that it's very difficult to do because you have, you need so many different skill sets. You need to either find a deal, underwrite the deal, raise the capital, do the day-to-day operations. There's a lot of different moving parts. So the more people you can find and work with, and you know, at the end of the day, don't you want to be doing something you love? If you love networking and let's say Chris doesn't like it, you do the networking. Chris stays in, stays at home and is underwear underwriting deals. You guys are both happy. And, and that's that. I'm not saying, I'm not saying either one of you, but that's what it comes down to. Jake loves the property management. If he's got to get on a coaching call, he'd rather shoot himself in the head than do that because he doesn't want to sit on, on a call for an hour and a half doing that. It's not that, you know, he's a D like in the, in the disc assessment. He just wants to get right to the point. I can dive in and ask more questions and try to find out. And, and I like doing that. I love helping people. So I love the education side of it. He loves the property management side of it. So that's what you ultimately want to end up doing is if you can scale up. So go out there and find partners to help you out. Yeah, you you make some really killer points there. And, you know, like, you know, there might be some people who can scale up by themselves. But ultimately, I think this is a team sport for everybody. You Mm -hmm. you might be able to do a lot of this stuff yourself, but I don't think there's any reason why you should be. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then you you mentioned just about like, uh, you know, just kind of finding yourself. You got to know what you're good at. You got to know what you bring to the table. So that way we can find a complimentary Mm -hmm. person to that or whatever. Mm -hmm. But that, like, I actually kind of want to like transition just a little bit, just on the on, on the on the topic of like education, right? I speak for I, I can speak for Danny and and I when I say like we both love the process of learning, you know, research, learning, just absorbing, you know, as much as possible, especially really when it comes mm-hmm. to like science and real estate. And uh, you know, as a side note, he and I we've been kind of kicking around this idea uh, about you know starting some kind of scholarship uh, just for, just for young, just for the young people, primarily just because Mm -hmm. we have our interests like in STEM fields and stuff. Yes. I remember being in school and not being taught anything about investing, you know, or or preparing your own taxes, balancing your checkbook, money management. Like it's all, and I, and I realized that is not a blanket statement across the nation. It's just, I'm a product of, you know, the schools that I attended. But, um, you know, just it, it, everything, it was just all like about preparing for college or just getting a job. Right. And none of us want to have like a job, like no one wants to actually work, you know, we're working for that financial freedom and everything. Have you ever asked yourself the question though, why is the system set up like that? Because why do 5% of the people who do really well understand finances? I'm not a conspiracy guy, but if I had to look at it objectively and I'm from Mars and I'm like, well, they're teaching you all these skills. Who cares about the war of 1812? If I can't pay my mm-hmm. bills or I can't balance my checkbook or I can't make an investment, that really doesn't mean anything because I can't live, you know, and, and the, everyone throws this word slavery around nowadays and you can look at it in any way. I think the, I think people today 
when they have debt, that debt leads you into slavery. I had the opportunity to speak oh, yeah. to Truett Cathy and, and uh, Steve Robinson was a CMO for Chick-fil-A. Let me finish this thought because that this was really empowering to me this past week. Truett Cathy had $250 million of debt at Chick-fil-A. He did not want to have any debt. He paid that debt off. Chick-fil-A is zero. They have zero debt. And what he said was, he's not beholden to anybody. He can make his choices. He can make his decisions. He doesn't owe anybody. He can sleep at night. When we owe other people, when we have a lot of debt, we don't have the opportunity to do what we want. And that's what's going on. So when people are financially unintelligent, they need to have that job. They need the government. They need others helping them out. But once that, that veil is lifted over them, they have the opportunity to do a lot of that stuff. So I say to you, public schools are not teaching us these skills because maybe they don't want us to learn the skills. It's incumbent upon us as parents, me to teach my kids what financial freedom looks like. And it's incumbent upon us as entrepreneurs to have these spaces to talk about these things. And, you know, rich dad, poor dad tried to do that. And I think he's done an amazing job doing that. But Let's learn the financial intelligence. It's great. We should go to school. School is great. We all want to learn. But there's a financial aspect that we're not learning. And it's important for us to learn that. I mean, gosh, think about that. I didn't know what an asset was. I didn't know what a liability was mm-hmm. when I when I was in college. I went to I went, I went to I went for finance. When I got out, I didn't know how to run a business. That there's things that we don't, they don't teach us that stuff in school. So you know what? It's we have YouTube now. There's places to learn it, but really figure out what you want to do and surround yourself. It's all about proximity. Listen to these to these venues that you're there. Find out. And I'm telling you, entrepreneurs are gonna save the world. Bottom line. Can't agree with you more on that. Um, mm-hmm. I'm actually I'm actually curious, you know, knowing that you have a, a pretty good sized family. I'm curious what you think about uh, like what your children are being taught in school, re- just regarding this whole this whole conversation we've been having, and then you know just when it comes to financial education, and and what they're not taught, and what are the things that like you're trying to instill in them, the things that you've been learning. So Chris, I, I'm very lucky. I have an amazing wife. So we've been homeschooling. So I have a daughter who's 21 years old. She just graduated college all the way down to six. We started homeschooling when my first child was born and we've done it ever since. I was that weird guy 20 years ago, right? My wife had had four kids at home, four home births, and all six are homeschooled. Now, everyone wants to be like Gina, right? COVID put everyone home. Everyone's homeschooling. Everyone wants to have home births and all that. But I was the weird guy, right? I guess I was just a little bit smarter. But for us, it's that responsibility junkie, right? I've been in business since I was 24 years old. So I've been making payroll for the last 26 years of my life. We schooled our kids. That's the responsibility aspect of it. And for us, homeschooling is just part of our lives. I've been really fortunate, you know, spend two to three hours a day in school with the kids. My wife does that. And I'm able to bring them the Jake and Gino events. I'm able to have them listen to me on coaching calls. My daughter runs around the house, the six-year-old. Is this the Jake and Gino show? Is the, she, she's <laughs> imbued with that. And she knows like dad's never had a real job, right? What does dad do? They don't even know what I do, right? They come to the closings. They come to see the properties. And you know what? I, I do let them invest. I let my son invest his capital into the deals. And it's amazing what that happens. When you have skin in the game, all of a sudden my son's like, well, why are there no owner draws this month? He's 18 years old. Owner draws. Wow. Dad, how many units got to go to market? Wow. That, that became a priority for us. All of a sudden we've got 146 unit property. We had it for about 18 months. It wasn't really doing that that much in owner draws. It's like, dad, what's going on? And I'm like, you know what, let me go ask. And we came up with a priority on that. Dad, why aren't there draws this month? When did we refi this property, dad? All these questions are because I include them in what's going on with the business. Don't be afraid to talk about money with your kids. Do not be afraid because it's important. Mm Because if they're not going to learn it from you, they're going to learn it from somewhere else. Man, I think that's uh, probably got to be a pretty, pretty incredible feeling to have your kid come to the come to those conclusions himself, or you know, ha- have those yeah. questions himself. Like, what's going on? And you're like, actually, I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> that's a good it was question. really cool because I'm like, well, you know what? I got to find out how many units need to go to market. We made that a Q2 priority, so there's 17 units left, and we're documenting every 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 week. We get on a weekly huddle. There were 22 three weeks ago. Now it's down to 17. And as we get them to market, that's a great metric because when you're taking a property over, you're trying to push rents. And if you don't keep that metric, that's a metric that we learn. If you don't keep that metric, you don't know what's going to market because ironically, the whole world was, the sky was falling a year ago. We're back to rent and raise rents, man. Rents are up big time in, in Tennessee. The last, last 12 months were probably up 6%. And I envision them going up even more because home, homes are getting to be more expensive. People can't find a place to live and they got to continue to rent. The demand is there. 
Absolutely. Man, Gino, you know, we've, we've talked a, about a lot of stuff, uh, you know, in this quick uh, conversation we've had. Really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. But before we get out of here, we want to take some time and shine the spotlight on you. So tell the listeners what else you have going on. Maybe talk about your courses, books, podcasts, mentorship program, anything you want. I have a lot of stuff going on. As you can see, six kids, multiple businesses. My passion is Jake and Gino. So just go to jakeandgino.com. You know, we've got three podcasts a week. We've got the 100-year real estate investor that just launched. We've got mentorship. We're doing deals. The big thing, I think, October 23rd and 24th, we have the MM4 Multifamily Mastery 4. It's our live event. It's in Orlando uh, at the Gaylord Palms. We did one in 2019. And unfortunately, the last year we couldn't do one. But this year we're back. And we're looking at 600 investors in that room. If you're in multifamily, if you want to learn, if you want to network, if you want to get out of your comfort zone, if you want to come shake my hand, it's going to be a great place. So October 23rd and 24th at the Gaylord Palms. Awesome. Awesome, man. You guys are making big moves. We're going to make sure to put all that stuff in the show notes so our listeners can find out, find that, reach out to you guys and be a part of uh, anything you guys have going on. Gino, it's been a great conversation, man. Really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. Thanks, guys. Hey, thanks for listening to today's episode. Head over to iTunes to subscribe to the show. And while you're there, we really appreciate you leaving a rating and written review. If you have any questions or topics you'd like to hear on the show, connect with us on social media or through our website at twosmartassets.com. We look forward to speaking to each and every one of you. Talk to you soon.